All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, good to see everybody. Oh, there's Wasim. Um, we have a special guest speaker today. You, we've all met him, um, John. Um, Bob, you know him the best. So I was wondering, do you want to introduce him? Well, he's a special brother to me. We're uh, J James St. James has just joined us. We are now now seventy plus. <laughs> and uh, John and I were talking several months ago, and he said, "You know, I'm in my mid seventies, kind of, you know, kind of trying to determine what I want to do next." And I reminded him that Jeremiah said, "After seventy years, be completed in this place." That's when things are going to start happening. John and I have some very inspiring phone conversations. He's, in a, he's a, an exceptional guy that, that lives in a really big tent. He, he sees things from a ministry standpoint, from a business standpoint, from a teaching standpoint, from a political standpoint. Uh, so he's got a lot to say, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you got to say, bro. All right. Well, as Bob and I, <clears throat> by the way, I met Bob because uh, of his response online on Facebook with uh, puns. I enjoy <laughs> puns. And so I reached out to him. First thing you know, we were talking on the phone and it's gone from there. But as I said to him when we were speaking a couple of days ago, hopefully this will be a conversation. I have worked in five different sectors and, uh, and I'll try to give you a little bit of background without taking a whole lot of the time for background, but I was, I am fourth generation Pentecostal. I'll say that up front to let you know that I have seen, uh, I guess, both the miraculous and the ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, and then at 16, <clears throat> even though I really do believe, whether it's the way I'm wired or whatever, that I occasionally hear the voice of God. And, and I say that with an understanding of, I have a, what I tell people, a fifth grade equivalency of a biology physics degree from 1970. So I do understand a little bit about the physical universe and of late more and more galaxies. So when I talk about hearing the voice of God, uh, to me, that's, again, either way I'm wired or some sense of privilege or just that maybe my mom and dad did a good job of teaching me to listen to him because I remember the first time I heard what I call the voice of God, I was probably about 10 years old. And I remembered waking up in the middle of the night and I could see this opening into heaven. This is a child now, I'm 10 years old. So that's what in the environment that I was in, uh, that must be what it was. And I heard this high church music. Now, I hadn't been used to high church because we were usually in the storefront or I was in the basement while parents were upstairs in the sanctuary and that kind of thing. But I heard something that I've never forgotten in terms of this almost orchestration. I remember the first time I heard an orchestra in a large church, I began to weep. Uh, and that, that night, though, I woke up and I remember walking into my mom and dad's bedroom, still seeing that vision and hearing that music. You can imagine how that felt to a 10-year-old. And I tried to describe it. I remember, uh, I remember standing at the end of the bed and trying to describe to my mom what was going on. And this was her response. This will give you an idea in a nutshell of how I was raised. I tried to explain. She said, Johnny, that's what she called me, St. James. She, she said, Johnny, why don't you go back to bed? It's probably the Lord speaking to you. And I just took her for granted. And from that moment on, it's not been difficult for me to think that I would hear the voice of the Lord. And so by the time I was 16, I remember making a decision that I had enough of this kind of Pentecostal church thing that I was raised in. My great grandfather was a horseback riding, pistol carrying pastor. He put all that together because where he was, he had to carry a pistol. 
Uh, and uh, they say the only time he shot it was when some guys tried to hold him up and uh, a bird flew by and he pulled the pistol out, shot the bird and killed it. And they kind of went away. Uh, that was luck or maybe, I don't know. But anyway, at 16, I walked away. I led a life from 16 to probably 25. I tell people I've never robbed a bank nor killed someone. I tried to kill a person one time with a gun and he drew a gun on me and we, there was a fifth of liquor behind him, Jack Daniels, and we just decided we needed a drink. And I taught chemistry the next morning to high schoolers. I was in a, a chemistry teacher at the time. And about, uh, after about three years, of just madness, craziness. I mean, I was 24 years old, walked into my dad's living room, and uh, I don't know if I said any of this to you the last time I talked, walked in my dad's room late at night. He, his doors were unlocked. I just walked in, and I heard a conversation going on between him and someone using my name, and I thought that was curious. So I walked into the living room, and this old guy, because he was about 40, and I was 24, this old guy was using my name verbally in prayer. And I walked over to tell him to get a life. And that's how cold I was. I didn't have any kind of sense of spiritual moment. And I touched him on the shoulder and something came into my hand and began to flow out of my feet. And I remember standing there like I was there right now, trying to figure out from a physics perspective how that was happening. And nothing was coming out of my feet, but something was flowing out of my feet. And so in that kind of a moment, I had this aha. And I remember looking out the window of his home, picture window, and just saying, God, if, if, if this is real and you're real and you can change my life, I'll give it to you. That morning, I cried all the way to chemistry class because I turned on my, tele my uh, radio and all of a sudden there was this gospel music. It's the truth. I didn't tune it in. I just turned it on. And this person was singing this, Horace, you may have heard before Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name, uh, like the fragrance of the rain. It was raining outside. I remember I rolled down the window in my 1971 Cougar, and uh, the only the bank owned it. I drove it, but uh, I was a school teacher, you know, making, I think, $4,500 a year uh, and trying to pay off a $2,000 loan. But anyway, I, from that point, uh, my school principal was involved at that point with uh, full gospel businessmen. Uh, they had a Methodist prayer breakfast that was going on in town. He asked if I would want to attend. I did. First thing I knew, I was leading it. Next thing I knew, I met an Assemblies of God pastor. I confessed to being raised Pentecostal. He visited me. Next thing I know, I'm the assistant pastor. This is years passing. And, and, uh, went back for a master's degree in fund development because of my involvement with a number of community nonprofits. Uh, got home that day, uh, heard the voice of, this is just true, I mean, you can read it any way you want to. Again, maybe the way I'm wired. I remember picking up a newspaper on the washing machine that my wife had laid out after my comprehensive exams. I saw where a lady had retired from the school system that I was not a part of, but lived within the district of. I picked up the newspaper, saw that headline and heard the Lord say, that's your job. I called the superintendent, uh, met with uh, about 10 people asking me questions about a place I knew nothing about. I made up answers. Uh, he told me he hired me within the first 10 minutes because of my answers. Uh, I served five years, got my superintendent certification was prepared to lead the school system. And by then I'm an Assemblies of God men's director. I'm going, I'm fire hosing you right now and I'm gonna stop and you can ask me questions. But I uh, had met this young man who at that time we were in kind of a mega church moment in my hometown. And that facility was growing right beside of Wake Forest University so rapidly that he was struggling. He was about 33. And I said, his name is Ron McManus. And he was telling me about things. And I said, look, everything you need is what I do for the school system. And uh, I said, have you ever considered putting all that in one basket and let a guy kind of work through it? I became an executive pastor, grew the church out from 11 acres to about 35. It just sold to Wake Forest. And, and uh, that whole mega church piece, we went to about 5,000. 
I left about three years ago, uh, and uh, maybe seven now, I guess, uh, to visit a young pastor in town I met in 94, happens to be Presbyterian, charismatic, uh, just a grace message, kind of like the book that I held up with Steve McVeigh. I am a reader. Uh, I, I tell people books find me, and uh, it just almost seems like that that guides me. But I then, at a certain point in time, uh, this is 2007, a uh, gentleman from NASA moved in next door to me, kind of a science guy. Uh, we got to talking. He had run for council, failed uh, election, and asked if I would work with a group in a political action committee. I set it up. After a while, they began to inquire me. I couldn't find a good no, so I ran for mayor. And I was mayor for three terms here until I tried to float a uh, uh, a referendum to repair a major interchange in our our community. Uh, I, I, that was probably the worst leadership moment of my life uh, because I realized that about five or six guys that owned land were controlling what was happening, and I tend to speak into things like that. That gets me in trouble sometimes, uh, but. Shortly after that, he helped found a local foundation, the Shallow Ford Foundation. We got a $10 million gift from a guy that's grown now to about $27 million. Uh, I still am involved. I do some commercial development, land assemblage, that sort of thing. And uh, that's that's the story of my life. I love the Lord. I am very, I struggle a lot with the American church. My first book I wrote, it was called the church uh, repo, R-E-P-O, the church in foreclosure. And I believe the Lord spoke that to me December 28, 2008. Uh, I've always been ahead of the curve. Uh, right now, uh, that probably a bestseller if people knew where to find it. Uh, because I believe the church is in foreclosure. It's being returned to its rightful owner from the institution. And, you know, you can go back as far as, as Constantine. And you'll see about every 500 years, it's a major aha that occurs that shifts in a progressive way the body of Christ. And I think we're there right now. So I'll stop and we'll have a conversation. <laughs> Re republish the book, John. Pardon? Republish the book. Well, you, you can find it on John the Catalyst. Uh, I get get it on Amazon. It needs to be read. It's on Amazon. Good. It needs to be time. read. You need, we need to push it. You and I will talk about that. That <clears throat> needs to happen. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm open to any question. If you you can that that any of that might have jarred a thought in your mind. I told Bob I wanted it to be a conversation instead of me just kind of jumping who I am. I can talk as long as I need to, but I don't really feel like I need to. So. I was my Lutheran friend, Anders, who's muted right now, but what are you hearing? <laughs> I'll call on if you don't ask a question. I, I have, I have a, a little difficulty hearing you. Okay. Yeah. But okay. Uh, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, more of an existential nature. And that is, the Bible often speaks about uh, that we shall rejoice, we shall be happy, we shall be uh, full of life. Me, myself, I have had uh, all my life uh, a more um, depressed nature. So to say, uh, like a melancholic, melancholic nature. I wonder if if does that say something that that is wrong with with the uh, with my with my relation with with Jesus? Because I I don't feel so, but uh, uh, sometimes I think there is something wrong. I should be more happy. Now, I'll, I'll try to speak into that. I have, I have always been a little reckless, high risk, 
I work with people right now, but I mean, we just are finishing a $40 million uh, situation that required the assemblage of seven properties. And uh, we got into it, well into it. This guy's already spending money. And I find out that someone's trying to hijack it. And I had to call and give him the bad news. And I remember him saying, John, that's quite a gut punch because he's kind of serious. And I said, well, the only thing is when I heard the bad news, I also heard the Lord say to me, I've got this. We need to keep working on it. And and now it's completely completed and actually in rent up phase. I have always kind of, I've, I've never needed it. I've never been asked to leave. I've never been fired. I've never needed a job, but I've always done what I believe in my gut that does not violate my heart, that I can manage with my head. I've always felt the tendency to pursue that. You probably wouldn't want to live the way I live. I love it. And yet at the same time, I don't discredit. And I, I here's a book you might want to read by Pat Lencioni, Six Types of Working Genius. He basically breaks down personalities and and how those personalities add value collectively and and he doesn't speak to the body of christ but i think there's a reason why the term body is used i'm not so sure that the body is not becoming the christ uh in the, in this era that we're in right now era <clears throat> but i enters to me that personality tendency that might relatively by might by comparison to myself might seem a little depressed, a little less joyous. And yet at the same time, my guess is there are moments you've stepped into where your personality added to uh, <clears throat> this concept of stone soup. Have you ever heard that before? Where you just bring whatever you've got and it makes this amazing soup, but okay. really it's just a gathering of stones. You're no. one of those stones. So, you know, I I get around some people that uh, make me look uh, melancholy. <laughs> you can believe it. But, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about that. To me, it's the joy of the Lord and how that manifests itself to you personally is a whole different thing than how it manifests itself to me. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Otters, out. Otters Jesus, Jesus picked 12 different guys. Very different people. Look at them. He picked, uh, he picked Philip, who, who was young and enthusiastic and had been following John the Baptist around. And Philip went to his old, older brother, Nathaniel, who was brooding under a, an, in the shade of a tree and said, man, you, you got to come and see this Jesus of Nazareth. And the first thing Nathaniel said is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, this guy was, 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 was a complete downer. But I love what Phil, Philip said. It's one of my favorite scriptures. Philip said, come and see. And uh, Philip, in my opinion, my, the way I read it, thought, well, you know, this younger brother of mine is not going to leave me alone until I do this. So I'll patronize him and, and do it. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming from afar off, it says. And he said, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Man, Nathaniel had just just trash talked Jesus for the town he came from. But study Nathaniel. He, Nathaniel evangelized a continent. Uh, every one of those brothers was different. Every one of them was different. Somebody, can, No one can tell Anders how Anders should be except the Spirit of God in Anders. Yeah, Bob, I was, and I may have shared this with you, but about two years ago, uh, about two years ago, I, you talk about melancholy for me, and if I'm calling, if it's Anders and I'm calling you Anders, it's because one of the best friends is Nancy Anders, so I apologize, Anders. Is it Anders or Anders? It's Anders. Anders, okay, I'll, I'll, thank you. But anyway, I got to where when I would hear people use the name of Jesus, I would have this kind of downer moment. Like, I didn't want to hear it. 
And I mean, from people that I respected in their walk, they would use the name of Jesus and wherever they were going, it would turn me in opposite direction. And so I'm sitting here at my workstation where I'm at right now. And I'm just, I was doing something. I forget what it was. And I just said, God, what is going on with me? And I heard the Lord say, uh, again, however I'm wired or whatever, whatever, wherever I hear something from inside of me that's spiritual, I heard the Lord say, now you know how I feel when they use my name, but never intend to be like me. And for this day, when people use the name of Jesus, I have that same moment that I hope you don't have that moment constantly, Anders, because it is demoralizing almost. And yet it's driving home to me the reality of how distant the American church is from who the Christ was. And and one of the things, and I'll uh, entertain another question, but I was sitting here also one morning and I heard the Lord say, come with me. And I didn't leave my workstation, but in my spirit, I left my workstation. And I know, I, I recognized immediately, I see the hand up, St. James. I recognized immediately that I was in that Thursday night moment. And I, the reason for my being there was to watch the difference, and Bob was speaking to this, in his disciples. And I literally saw John leaning on Jesus. The King James, I think, says he's leaning on the breast of Jesus. John just loved Jesus. And I, and I do, too. That's why I weep so easily. Uh, he, just, he just wanted to be near him. He wasn't even listening to what he had to say. And, and Peter, this other guy, is like, listen, John, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. And I tell Peter, this is Peter saying, show me who it is, cut his damn head off. And Peter tried. And then I see Judas. I mean, it's all in the same vision. I see Judas saying, whoa, 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 whoa guys, I, I got this. I got this. I have a plan. I know who to get him in front of. And when I get him in front of, he'll show out, he'll call down a legion of angels. You watch. And he took him before the church and they threw 30 pieces of silver at him. That's the cheap shot of the American church. I'm, yeah. I just attended church this morning, so I'm not throwing rocks at the windows from the outside. I am a churchman. Okay. But what, what Jesus showed me, though, was the different types of people it takes to drive where providence is taking this thing. So I don't discount anyone, whether they look silly relative to my life or uh, appear down relative to the joy that's inside of me. But anyway, St. James, where are you at? You raised your Please hand. Stand, yeah. stand patiently waiting. Okay. And Ann, okay. Yeah. Stand, stand, stand up. Stand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll yeah. listen to you, Melissa, from now on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Not so much a question, but to address what Anders was speaking of. Uh, Bob earlier used a term. He talked about identity theft. Yeah. And I think a lot of times in our case, the false self or the ego wants to give us an identity right. that is contrary to the truth. Um, Melissa recently shared in an email several uh, discussions that dealt with I am affirmations. Oh. And I found those to be particularly encouraging to me in recognizing who the Father says I am. There's so much, you know, and when we focus on that, when our minds become uh, attuned to what our true identity is, it makes a, a difference. You know, we can't entertain uh, thoughts that are that are unlike Christ when we, you know, when we see really this is who I am. And, you know, you know, even simple things like saying I am blessed and I am loved. Those things, you know, even just hearing those words or or meditating on those things, it, it really changes, I, I believe, our perspective. So I would encourage you, Anders, to to really focus on something like that. Yeah, and Stan, uh, again, back around, I'm not trying to sell Pat Lencioni's book, 
but he breaks this thing down into genius, competencies, and frustrations. Your genius are those things that when you find yourself doing them, there is a heartfelt joy. And I think that's where vocation and calling align. And that alignment is where joy comes from. Competencies are things you're strong at and can add value at, but it's not where you get joy. I don't get joy from assembling properties for multifamily developments. I can do it. And then frustrations are the things that really you need to stay away from because you'll you'll uh, you, you you can damage. I've been in a partnership before where I've heard the Lord say, "John, you're damaging the partnership." I called the guy and stepped out. Uh, I don't enablement to me is is a frustration. If I have to carry something a long time in trying to enable people to get where they need to get, I'll end up frustrating them. Uh, three to five years about the window of my <laughs> life. St. James, go ahead. How'd I do, Melissa? Uh, good. <laughs> so good. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And you know, prophetic uh, words are like that as well. And, and I've already heard Stanley and Melissa and you, John, confirm something that I heard pertaining to uh, Anders' uh, short uh, share uh, about melancholy and that that propensity as a, if you will, a personality type, which yeah. again is goes back to the issue of identity that Stanley spoke so well of. You know, I am. I'm not that. I don't have to be that. I can be who I am in Christ. And I really hear the, the uh, for An Anders, the, what I heard as you shared was focus, where energy, or where focus goes, energy flows. Right. And, and it's, it's it, uh, as our, as it con concerns our identity, our focus must be on Jesus. And uh, th then I also, I heard the refrain of a song I absolutely love. It was written back in the 1800s by a guy named Rufus McDaniel. Thank you, uh, Webb here. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll know the title. I want to read a little bit of it to you. It says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which I, for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. And the refrain was what, what I was hearing, and, it, and it, uh, it's just so beautiful. I want to share it. It says, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. And, and just as a fellow member of the body of christ i want to tell you that this jesus in your heart is your focus and our focus and anytime we quiet ourselves when we're having a moment that we know doesn't comport with our identity these these truths these these moments of joy we've discovered on our on our journey will come to us and will rescue us like a like a rope to a boat in a storm and and pull us back to this anchor of our soul this this Christ in us our hope our joy our one great love our our the true light you know whatever whatever however you know Jesus in your most intimate time with him that's who he is all the time so that just wanted to give that to you brother Melissa. <laughs> Thank you, St. James. That was um, amazing. And Stanley, too. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I'm glad you reminded me of that because I need to take my own advice. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, you, it occurred to me that it's been a while since I've read those out loud. And it really, uh, he's not kidding, Anders. It makes a difference. When you and I can send them to you if you want, but it is when you read them out loud, um, it's just kind of speaks to your own soul and reaffirms for you. But um, I was wondering, 
and, and and you know I relate because I tend to have that depressive um oh I don't want to say personality but that's the closest I can come as well um I will say that one thing that I've seen in you Anders that seems to give you joy is you have such a beautiful heart of an artist you're you're um balancing your your stones I mean they're amazing and they that seems to give you some joy and also that beautiful beautiful um Swedish music that you um that you shared with all of us at Christmas time that was just um to me that seemed like something that gave you joy as well so I think you have things that I think you're capable of joy, certainly, and have things that bring you joy. It, just because you don't feel it nonstop all the time, it's okay. It's okay because Jesus is with you in whatever you're feeling. Um, he's not, you know, he's not waiting for you to be in a good mood or whatever. He's, uh, no matter what you're feeling or going through, he's going right there through it with you. And um, I'm speaking that to myself too. I uh, I have a lot of things on my plate right now, and there's some exciting opportunities. You know, I'm about to turn. I'll turn 60 in September, and I didn't know if any opportunities like this were ever going to come my way again, and they have. And so I'm going to cry. I'm going to try not to cry. So you would think that I would be. And I have been excited, but you think you'd think I would be so excited that I just jump on them, but something holds me back too. Like, um, you know, that lack of confidence that I've tried to shake, that I've spent my whole life trying to shake. You know, and or fear of failing, of not being good enough at it. Um, just in a nutshell, John, I'm in. I never went to college. I, I got married right after high school and had a family and blah, blah, blah. But I am attending Global Grace Seminary right now, going um, working towards a bachelor's degree. And I got a work study program through them. I'm Matt Handel's administrative assistant in lieu of tuition. So they're paying my tuition and I do work for them. So that, and I have um, the responsibility, which I haven't yet really taken up the mantle of, <laughs> of putting New Life in Christ TV show on the GAN network, the new GAN network. And I, what do you do when you, I mean, you strike me as somebody who never has problem with motivation, but <laughs> where do you find it when you really need because I'm also dealing with health issues at the time. I got a heart monitor on right now. And so all I want to do, you know, physically is nothing to be just bluntly honest. And I don't know. I don't know what my question is. How do yeah, I, I do. How do you find motivation when it's not just coming naturally? So Melissa, can, can you see my face while you're talking? Yes. <laughs> I connect the dots. See, while you were talking, I'm thinking, my God, the number of dots that are connected in your life, to me, I don't have a lot of confidence in myself. I love to play second fiddle. That's why I enjoy, I've, I've served six of probably the most committed, well-skilled leaders more than that. Always is second fiddle. I don't like a lot of hoopla. Uh, yeah. That was my biggest challenge as mayors because you become the face of council. Uh, but I get motivation when I see dots connecting. I assume it's not me. It's it's whatever you want to call it, providence or whatever. And and I just I act on that. I do when I see two or three things coming together, I'll move on it. And if I can't move on, I'll invite someone to move on it with me and let them have it. Uh, you know, that's I, I read another book by a guy, Senecti, I believe his name is, uh, that 
I think I might have mentioned this last time, but finding your purpose for existence. To me, you represent a piece of God, P-I-E-C, that passes understanding. You can't grasp it. I can't grasp it. You represent a piece of God that's never been assigned to another, nor will it ever be, that's critical to whatever you want to call this word we use, kingdom, unpack it, and people will value that. I, I want to know, and I just saw him shake his head, so I want to know, and Stan's got his hand up, but somewhere in there, Philip, I want to hear what's in your eyes. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Stan. Yeah. Okay. One of the biggest lies that we have been fed is the lie of separation. We've been lied to that we are separated from God, that God is separated from us. He's angry with us and we got to do something to get his attention and all those types of things. Those are all lies. But the true I am is I am one. I'm one with him. We are inseparable. And when we can allow ourselves to accept that we are loved by him, the creator of the universe, imagine that, can you think about that? We are accepted by him, we are loved by him, and it's not based on anything we have done or not done. You know, I, we allow our minds to wrap around that, I mean, that in itself will give us a sense of joy and a sense of purpose. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how indoctrinated we have become at this thing of working for Jesus. And I was reading in Romans this morning, I think it's 3, 23 to 31. There's nothing you can do to improve or diminish the love of God that Stan just described. Stan, are you a preacher? Because that preach. Uh, Let me jump in quickly and say, uh, not by works of righteousness, yeah. which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved yeah. us by the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And, you know, when Christ raised from the dead and, and met his disciples, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. That made them holy. And holy saint is another word for holy. God. And I, even, I if, even if we are faithless, he all he remains faithful. Yeah. It says he cannot deny himself. And that's yeah. talking about us. Yeah. And, and, and Anders or Anders has his hand up, but again, and I don't know much about this guy. I just I don't know where I found it. But he basically says we believe the lie that was first this the distort I, oh God. Moses, who wrote Genesis, was trying to explain to a group of people that were hungry but had just walked across the Red Sea. And it's like, how do I handle this? I believe that he crafted Genesis for that reason. I think that there's inspiration there, but we take it too literal. And, and the lie that we believed that was... First, uh, first spoken, I guess, in Moses' story by the serpent is that we were separated from God. It was God looking for us. I, I no longer believe the scriptures nearly as literal as I was taught and less and less valuable to me apart from the spirit of God. As one guy I read said, it's a dumpster dive without the spirit. That's heavy stuff. Anders, uh, Melissa, I'm doing your job. Call on Anders. <laughs> well, thank you all for your uh, encouragement. And uh, Melissa, thank you for reminding me about the stones and the pictures. Because uh, I know I have this uh, artistic um spirit so to say in me and i and i love it when i when i can make something beautiful and when i can edit the the pictures to make them even more beautiful and uh, also the funny thing the strange thing 
you know, I'm laughing now, okay? And uh, wh whenever, whenever I am with other people, I always talk and I always make them laugh. Hmm. So perhaps it's something about this old thing about the sad clown they're talking about. I don't know. <laughs> so, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not un unhappy. So I, I, I feel consent, so to say. And I know uh, I'm also 70 plus. I will be 75 in nine days. And uh, I have uh, God gave me the the grace to to have been sober for all, almost forty years, so I'm living on what would you say overtime. Uh, if I had uh, if I had not finished to 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 drink, I should have been dead. Now I shouldn't be here talking with you. So and also I my health like you. Melissa, you know, my health has also been uh, not so good lately. And I, I'm more and more and more and more aware of that there is an end to the, to the life in this, uh, in this uh, uh, here on earth, whatever. You, you know, uh, Melissa wanted me to be speaker this, this, this week, but I told her my, my English is not so fluid. So it will not be so interesting. But uh, I, I know more and more that there will be an end. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, the old uh, monks, they say whenever they lay down to sleep, they are um, um, preparing how to die. They, they are learning how to die whenever they day down to sleep and i think that's uh, i think for me at least it's it's very essential that i we can meet death with a smile on my face uh, and not be anxious and uh, so i think that's uh, i mean some kind of a preparing for this i think in some way perhaps it sounds very uh dark or whatever but uh, it's not you know we all know that we are we are not going to die really death has no power over us but uh, we still have have uh, our flesh to to uh, to fight so to say or to to, to compete with in these thoughts, I guess, our ego or whatever you say. So, um, well, so, so, so the, the, I, I'm very happy that whenever I meet my friends or it, even wherever I go, I talk with everyone and wherever I go, I, I make jokes and I, I make them laugh. And I think perhaps that's also a mission to make people laugh. Even if I can lay in my bed the other day, next day, and feel depressed and feel like now I had enough, <laughs> like uh, Elijah after he he conquered the 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 Baal's uh, prophets. So I got to... have you ever thought about how powerful? your ability to make people laugh is and that next day i don't know if you ever heard of spiritual warfare you may be doing more good than you think and and the enemy possibly threatened by that i don't talk much about the enemy because he was slain for all practical purposes the the the, the cross is a stake in his head uh but I don't believe that we die. I had to say this to you, Anders. Uh, I tell people when I'm talking to them, if my body falls off, call my wife. She knows what to do with it. Uh, I believe I've been in a room with people. I'm 70, I'll be 76 in a couple months. And I've been in a room with people when they pass. And I don't know if you ever experienced that or not. When I you do. feel a spirit leave the room, I yeah. think that's who they were. 
what we have left is their old clothing and we bury it or burn it or whatever. Uh, again, that's what I mean when I say call Adonis, she'll know what to do. Uh, and Melissa, back to your heart situation. I have a heart valve repair. One of the most wonderful moments of my life was when they wheeled me into the room and there were 10 people around me. And I said, now, what are you going to do? And they said, well, we're going we're gonna to chill your body down so your heart stops. And like, well, then how are you going to crank it back up? And they said, well, we'll warm your body back up. We will withhold some potassium. We'll put potassium in your body and your brain will tell your body to start. And I'm like, wow. And I had the most amazing moment that, that finally the guy that, believe it or not, is one of the investors as a, a, a uh, uh, anesthesiologist in one of the projects. I mean, now we met later. He said, I know you. I'm the one that put you to sleep because he said to me, Mr. Boss, can you just be quiet and take a deep breath? We've got five hours in front of us. So they put a lock washer on my heart. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the heart monitor and stuff like that, again, you said you were 60. You're a youngin. Okay. <laughs> you're a youngin. You got a lot ahead of you. I'm 76 and I'm a youngin. So yeah. I'm just hanging there with me. Okay. Make me laugh. <laughs> but I want to hear Philip. I've not seen his eyes move, and I'm curious. And what's in your head, Philip? If I could do that, Melissa. Of course. <laughs> Did Philip hear me? Philip, I think he wants to hear from you. Well, thank you for the invitation, uh, John. Uh -huh. <laughs> do you remember I wrote to you a couple of weeks ago about your the front page of your website? Uh huh. And I commented on that lake. Do you yeah. remember what I wrote there? Yeah, uh, go ahead. I, I remember seeing that. I don't well, know if I responded to you or not. That was another friend's image of me. Well, you you actually did respond. And I, I've i got um on my desktop a similar pic, uh, page, also with mountains in the background yeah. and a lake with a mirror of the mountain on the lake. Right. And it's exactly what you got on your website. And something like that is to me um, more fascinating than actually all the troubles that I've had in my life. Wow. Um, I've got three qualifications and I've been sacked a couple of times in my life and I've got quite high grades for them. So I find what I've achieved not relevant to what the beauty of life is. That's kind of like my max or my my kind of stand in life. I see the beauty in 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 what what God's created, and not in what I've achieved because I've tried to achieve and I've failed every time. So that's kind of what I've experienced. Uh, so you fell forward. Falling Forward, that's a book I read by exactly. Richard, Richard Rohr. Exactly, yeah. 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 It's kind of a legacy of my life. Yeah. yeah. It, it was interesting, The uh, and I, I think I saw another hand or something, maybe in Lenny's, but uh, it's interesting, after I did the funeral of a young kid who had died from an overdose of fentanyl, and... Uh, I was later with a principal here locally, and we were trying to decide what we could do at the high school to limit that sort of thing and all. And the lady beside of me, when we introduced ourselves, she turned to me and she said, Are you, you're John Boss. And I said, yes, ma'am. I was told I needed to write a book about you. And I said, about what? And she said, well, just the different sectors and things that you, and I tried to, over about an 18-month period, download to her why I made the transitions that I made in each of those journeys. And I realized she just didn't get it from a spiritual standpoint. She was writing from an uh, investigative journalist. I think it's what she was. And that's the book called uh, The Catalyst. I think it's called The Catalyst. I don't, it's been a long time, uh, four or five weeks ago. But uh, I really do try to fail forward in the spirit. And I tell people, if I have a sense of gut discernment and it doesn't violate my values in my heart and I can manage the risk in my head, the faster I move, the more successful I'll be. 
And that's why I have been in so many places that if you just looked at my story, you'd think, God, this guy can't even hold a job down. It's not that after three to five years, I'm through. I'm excitement. It's gone. If I stayed there, Anders, I would probably be depressing to the people around me. Unlike you, you are not depressing. Bob has his hand up, so I'll shut up. Man, there's so much here. Anders, I sent you a song, brother. Uh, I uh, I was talking with Flo yesterday morning, and uh, I said, uh, there's so much truth and so little time. And that and a couple of other things caused me to write a blog yesterday called Looking for Elisha. You know, Elijah was... Uh, was quite a guy, man. I wrote a song about him one time. I didn't record it. I wish I had. Elijah was a prophet of the Lord. He called down rain. He called down fire by God's holy word. He burned and slew Baal's prophets, and he never did retire. He got a ride to the other side on a chariot of fire. Are you willing to be on fire? But at one point, after after Elijah had had burned and slayed, slayed uh, Baal's prophets, after he call down rain he elijah had been a member a a, a, a a widely accepted member of religion and religion loves prophets as long as they speak religion's truth they get real nervous when they start speaking god's truth elijah elijah was speaking truth to power he's speaking truth to religion and at one point, that that religious power, that religious spirit came after him, and he found himself, Anders, in a cave, saying, God, I'm all by myself. I'm done. I'm, I'm down. I'm out. Won't you just take me? And you, you can go back and read that in First Kings. I think it's about 18, 19. Uh, the angel of the Lord came to, to, to Elijah and, and ministered to him. And the next thing you know, Elijah's out looking, man. He's out, he's out ministering again, and he comes along, he comes upon this young brother named Elisha who recognized him. And Elisha hadn't sold out. Elisha was just plowing, he was just doing his work. And we saw Elijah. He he immediately said, Man, you've got what I'm looking for. I want to go with you. And Elijah tried to warn him off. He said, this is not going to be easy. And Elisha wouldn't take it. Elisha ended up killing his ox and burning his plow, building a fire out of his plow so he could cook the ox and feed his village. And then he just took off with Elijah. In the last moments of Elijah's life, Elijah said, man, I'm a prophet and I know it's about time, about my time's about over. And Elisha said to him, uh, Give me a double double portion of what you've got. Elijah said, "Man, this that's not an easy thing you ask for." And Elijah Elisha said, "I'm I'm I'm down with it, man. I want it." And so Elijah Elijah laid off his mantle onto Elisha, and when he did that, a chariot of fire came and got him. Where we are in life, most of us on this call is we're looking for Elisha. Our uh, many of us are over seventy, and I'm not giving up on it. I'm seventy nine, man. I'm I'm less than a year away from being able to run up a mountain like Caleb did, right? But but the the opportunity that we have after seventy years passed in this place is to find Elisha's, and they're looking for us. They're looking for us. It's a whole generation, or two or three generations that haven't sold out to religion. They're looking for truth. Bob, I, I told you before, I spend hours weekly with yep. Yep. 30 to 50-year-olds writing now a book called Come Let Us Reason Together with a 28-year-old out of Washington State. But when you were talking, I believe that what you just described about Elisha is what won him the audience on the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't. I believe that the Mount of Transfiguration, again, my physics head, 
was Jesus being able to control the very energy that held his atoms together. That's why they saw his mantle glowing. And yet Jesus knew who was watching and needed some credibility. Okay, I said that lightly. Needed some credibility with the people that were watching his very disciples. So he brought Moses, whom they honored, and Elijah, whom they honored, that they assumed were dead to stand with him. And then later on the ascension, this is my heretic moment, on that ascension, I think he fully disassembled himself in front of them in such a way that they saw a cloud. <laughs> and, and, and the best they could think was that he's going to return one day on a cloud, not knowing that the spirit of Christ and the body of Christ, I'm going to say this, I have a Pentecostal moment. The spirit of Christ in the body of Christ is maturing in front of us, and we're fighting it like hell, waiting for the he rapture. Became, he became a cloud, and they literally right there breathed him in and didn't know it. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm on a call this afternoon with a young man who, first time I ever saw his face, I've never talked to him directly, but... First time I ever saw his face on a podcast, I, I, I thought, man, I've seen that look before and it's God, man. <laughs> I just know what it looks like. But but he's probably in his early 30s. And he and another brother have written a children's book about Jesus and the superhero that Jesus was and is. And he's I was listening to him on a podcast the other day and he was talking about his nine-year-old is starting to grip, get a grip on this. He's asking really good questions and stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking the Lord for the right words to say this young man today to tell him I'm 79 and you're, you're about, you're maybe somewhere close to half my age. And I'm getting to speak to you, but you're getting to speak to a nine year old that's 70 years younger than I am. Think about how many people he's going to touch. Think about how, think about the multiplier of the 70 years that he has ahead of him. And he's already got a word. For, he's already beginning to understand. He's beginning to understand now things now that I didn't understand a year ago. Uh, Bob, you're, you're the acorn that launched the oak that'll birth 10 million trees hallelujah man uh i uh the size of this thing and and we're each a component of it we're 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 each a part of that cloud that john was just talking about you know i love the great cloud of witnesses and i I used to think of my mother in the great cloud of witnesses cheering me on and so on and so forth. And it dawned on me one day, we're all part of the cloud. I wrote a, I wrote a song called until he reappears. One of the lyrics in it is, uh, 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 you'll be part of the cloud and that's talking to everybody. That's not talking to the deceased alone. And they really, they really aren't deceased. They, they are no longer here. They haven't ceased. They're they really ceased. Not deceased. They're really. Re <laughs> yeah. My mother up in her 90s would say, I'm not getting any older. I'm I'm eternal. She'd say I'm, my mortality kicks up once in a while, but I'm not getting any older. And and uh, so we're going to transition at some point or another. But we're not going to transition to less. We're going to transition to more. We're going to be another component, an, another voice at the heavenly level of the cloud that we are a voice to in the earthly level right now. And I, I won't even try to get my head around this because I just thought about it. But if we can reach many people here, under, limited by who we are, limited by, by this flesh, how many more will we be able to reach when we get to that next level and we're not inhibited by the flesh, we're just all spirit? Bob, one more thing. This book, Brave Cities, 
uh, that yeah. talks about the archaeology, artistry, artistry, and ar architecture of kingdom ecosystems. Th this is this is amazing. That I've I've spent two years praying over the city of Winston Salem, which has history all the way back to John Huss. But this is amazing to see what's happening in cities, written by two guys, McCall and Halter. I'm telling you, the, the institutional church is near has been and relative to what God is doing in cities, speaking to oak trees like that young guy that will birth millions. Uh, I think it's exciting. So I'll just kind of close my piece. I uh, I drove by a boarded up church in Kansas City, big old church, grand old building. It's boarded up in 1981. And I felt like the Lord said to me, there's a time coming when the churches won't be able to contain my people. And I thought that meant that there wasn't going to be room inside the building for them. But what it meant was you can't build a wall around them. You, the, the building won't contain them. First thing, first thing the church did, the first thing the, the, the brothers did and the sisters when the Holy Spirit came is they exited the building, which is a real good idea, by the way, when you got fire and, and, and strong wind in your building. But, but they exited the building and they never went back. They never went back. The church didn't go back to that building till Constantine came along and did what the church of today is doing. And that is try to mix the gospel with politics doesn't fit. And uh, identity fail. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, uh, the future. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Yet it's not entered into the heart of man what the Lord has prepared for those that love him. And that's not a funeral scripture. It's good at a funeral. It works great at a funeral. But that's a now scripture. Like all the rest of them, by the way, are now. You're your father's son, Anders. And <laughs> you know what he likes to say about his son? This is my beloved son and who I am well pleased And Amen. you're his son. You're his son. I just know a good time for you to say, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that lyric, I am my father's son. That's that's the title. That's that's the lyric. I am my father's son. Yeah. By the way, just for the record, God said that to Jesus before his ministry started, not after he did all of it. Yep. Yeah, because it wasn't based on anything he did. It was just based on who he was. <laughs> yep. Melissa, can we hear from Carolyn, Roger, and Lenny? Um, do you have anything to add, Carolyn or Lenny? Go ahead, you know, Lenny. It's the teacher in me. I'm sorry. It's the teacher in me. <laughs> I was just going to ask, uh, you mentioned that you struggled with some things in the church, and I was wondering, over the last, say, 10 or 20 years, is there any specific issues that were there, or could you also name maybe a few books that have helped you with those issues? We, we've only got about an hour, an hour and a half, Lenny. You know that, right? Or should we have part two? Let me hear, let me hear Carolyn first and make let me hear Carolyn first, and maybe I can go back around and catch both of them. Hi. I don't really have anything to add. I read your blog, a couple of them this morning to kind of prepare, prepare for what I was about to hear, and I've enjoyed the discussion very much, but I don't have anything to add. Thank you. No it's problem. Good to See you, Carolyn. Uh, I have one question. How's that puppy? Oh, wearing me out. I was actually trying to get her to do her business in time for me to get online. Uh, oh, yeah. She, she will not make a noise from the time I put her in the cage at night until a quarter till six, and she comes fully alive in her schnauzer, poodle, mixed kind of way. But back to Lenny, which has little to do with her, uh, my, my biggest challenge 
is that we're constantly trying to help people find Christ when without explaining to them that Christ is constantly trying to find them and in fact already knows them by name. Uh, I I would be dangerously close at 76 uh, of disputing about everything every evangelical has ever spoken into my life. Uh, I believe the the message is grace. That's why I, I, in reading this morning, uh, uh, in reading this morning in Romans, what Paul was trying to explain to the Jews, he had culturally slanted, okay? And we have used that as language for our doctrines of justification. I don't believe... I no longer believe in sacrificial atonement. Oh, I believe yeah. that Jesus died to remove any excuse that we might have about the love of the Father and the grace toward us by our God. Uh, I think that in early days of Abraham, he was still walking out of idolatry. I have worked with some of the best people in America, at least in some offshore, that really love God. And yet, every time they hear something from the Lord, they filter it through who they, who they are, transfer their brokenness. I believe that the gospel, I believe the scriptures capture us more than it does God. So I hope I answered your question, Lynn. That's what drives me nuts. But as in church gonna, this morning, so I got a level. I'm going to take the opportunity, hand raised, to chime in and say amen, John. Um, the inward law of God in our heart is grace. And our our if we're tasked with anything, it is to expound on that to others, to look within, because the grace of God is poured out into our hearts. Yes. And uh he's he's writing it there every day. We just want to look and see that. And uh we don't need all the Pentecostal filters I've I've experienced as well. We don't need others to interpret God for us. He's He's there in person. And Amen. every person that every person knows that is is a is our calling, if you will. Amen. Philip, did you want to add something too? Yeah, I just wanted to tell John that um I spent many years going to many different churches and studying their doctrines. Do you know how exhausting that was? <laughs> <laughs> it, I thought there was maybe 20 or 25 denominations at the most. When I found out there were many more, I gave it up. <laughs> Let me share one last Honest. thing, because I actually wrote it out in case somebody asked that kind of question. Okay. And, and, and so this goes back to my 500-year journey. If you go from Constantine, that's about 345. So it's not quite 500 years. Launched 500 or so years later, and you got the great schism in the church between East and West. And you can go on through until you get to the, the, the whole Reformation piece with Luther. Then the... Then the Church of England, because they didn't feel the separatists were separatists enough or the Puritans were Puritan enough. So 1620, the Puritans lead to come to America. And from that came later, even more the Azusa Street. That's where the Pentecostals came from. And then about 1916, the Anglicans, they broke off from the main scene of plot. You can hear that progressive journey with the body of Christ. Now, when you stop like Philip did and look at, I'm not talking about Philip and Ethiopia, I'm talking about Philip in front of my face. When you stop like Philip did and look at all the doctrines, and you can see there's a progressive work of God happening in the body of Christ, and we, the church, try to keep it static and use the text to justify it. So, wow, there you are, Lenny, again. What is your background, Lenny? Uh, joining with the what y'all have just talked about, I've been in charismatic churches, anti-charismatic churches, and churches in between. 
old fashioned, extremely old fashioned fundamentalist, evangelical, house church, organic church. I even got friends in emergent church and missional church. Uh, I've been all over so much and read so much. I almost got burnout and my brain doesn't want to read anymore. <laughs> so I understand everything y'all are talking about. It's real good. Stop reading and start writing, Lenny. That's what I'm doing now. I, I, I know it. And that's exactly what you need to do. It's huh. great therapy. My writing is about therapy. I don't need the income stream. I just need the therapy. It gets in there. It gets in there and it's got to come out, John. I mean, if it's three o'clock in the morning and it's there, it's that that doesn't matter. You got to do it then. You're compelled to do it. Paul McCartney kept a little tape recorder by his bed. We'd probably be amazed how many Beatles songs he had the presence of mind to hang the little lyric or, or hum the melody in the middle of the night. It probably wouldn't have been there in the morning. Yeah. You do it when it's there. Yeah. Hey guys. Well, you mentioned that. Just, just so you'll know, by the way, at the First Baptist Church, we accept all denominations, you know, 10s, 20s, 50s, whatever. Uh, um, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're not, we're, we are fully denominational, as a matter of fact. We'll take every denomination you got. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's about it is time to wrap it up. Um, anybody have any last things? I don't want to cut anybody off. I, okay. I'm gonna start uh, I'm gonna start hosting a Zoom call called Tuesday Tacos on the uh, Rethinking God and Tacos uh, uh, for the Rethinking God and Tacos group. If you're interested, PM me and I'll uh, I'll send you a link. Love to have you seven o'clock at Tuesday on Tuesday nights. Uh, very interesting group of people and you'd fit right in they'd love to have you hey bob why don't you send me that link and i'll send it out to anybody who might be interested i will get that done i will get okay, that done thank you okay by the way uh, in case you think it's frivolous uh somebody somebody jokingly said to jason clark who founded that group he said they said is taco some kind of an acronym and you know me with acronyms uh Matter of fact, acronym is an acronym for all characters relating or naming your message. But tacos, tacos is theosis always calling our spirit. Not, not try to eat one without feeling, feeling the Holy Ghost, okay? <laughs> <laughs> good job. Right. Good to have you, man. Really good to have you. Yeah, it was. Thank you, John. It was great. Really enjoyed the discussion today, everybody. Um, all right. Well, everybody, does anybody feel like closing in prayer? Lord, uh, <laughs> behold your people that you've chosen right now for this time and this place. And just give us little reassurances. Just let us know we're, we're on the right track. Because everybody here, everybody here wants to do the deal and it's not work. It's not that we want to do works. It's that we want to share what you gave us. So just continually remind us who we are, if you would. And it caused us to notice the little encouragements that I'm sure I'm sure are all around us all the time. Just cause us to notice them. Yes. And thanks for letting us be part of your deal. In Jesus' name. Amen. All Amen. right, everybody. Have a great week. Shalom, shalom. 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 Weird Mosty. The weirdness in me honors the weirdness in you, okay? <laughs> <laughs>